Thanks for joining us on this special evening. We have the great privilege, as we've been announcing for weeks and weeks and weeks in anticipation, we've got our very own Pastor Kurt DeGraff, counseling, uh, Pastor of Counseling and Family Ministries. Is that right? That's right. That's right. So uh, Andrew's got our first question here, because we, we don't want to waste any time. His time is valuable. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So you guys have been submitting questions for the last couple weeks, and so all the questions that we're going to talk through tonight are ones that you guys have asked. So we're really excited. It's fun to have this kind of change of pace and uh, to do something a little different. And so, Kurt, thank you for being here. Uh, we're, very, we're very thankful for you. Um, as Jared said, you're the counseling pastor here, and so you uh, deal with a lot of situations, all kinds of stuff, people that are struggling, people that need help. Uh, why don't we start by just saying, what are, the, what are some of the, you counsel adults and sometimes kids and students and, yeah. and people, these people's age as well. And so what are some of the top three maybe issues or uh, situations that you encounter in the counseling office with uh, students? Well, let me just say hey to everybody here tonight. It's a real privilege to be with you. Thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, it's good to hang with these guys. I work with them regularly. They're great guys. Jared and Andrew, love them. Their wives and all the youth staff. Let's give them all a round of applause. They do a great job. I want to give a shout out to those who were baptized on Sunday night as well. They did a great job. So proud of you. Really fantastic. Yeah. Way to stand up strong for Jesus Christ. I'm so grateful for that. Uh, just a little word about counselors. You know, um, there, there's a stigma out there about folks who go to counselors like, like, don't you have to be like half crazy to go to somebody like a psych or something like that? Hey, hey, I, I'm just an ordinary guy that pulls on my socks the same way you do, but God's called me to help people. And as a counselor, a biblical counselor, I'm just basically someone that disciples from the Word of God, helps people with their problems. And it's my delight to do so. I love people. I love Christ. I love you. I want to help you. And it's just a real privilege for me to be here tonight. So back to your question. Kurt, as someone who works with you, I can say you're not a normal guy, per se. <laughs> Kurt can get a little crazy sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Uh, the kind of things that students bring to me would probably be, he's asked for three of them. I would say the number one thing is relational struggles. Students come to me and say, struggling with dad and mom, some of the things they say to me, the interactions at home behind closed doors, struggling with my friends, trying to fit in. Uh, those kind of things are really dominant in the counseling office for adults as well as for students. Life is really all about relationships, and we got to be right relationally vertically with God if we're going to be right relationally horizontally with people, and we'll say more about that as we unpack our questions here tonight. I'd say a second thing that I encounter in the counseling office is students coming in feeling less than, feeling like somehow, you know, I'm not cutting it, I'm not on the inside group, you know, uh, I feel like the other kids don't really like me or I don't fit in. And so they come to talk about maybe their anxieties, some of their struggles underneath the surface. Mental health issues are big time problems for students today as they are for adults and we don't want to downplay that. If you're struggling with depressive kind of maybe even suicidal thoughts, we're here to try to help you. That's epidemic in society. Uh, along that same line, there are struggles with identity. Like, like, who am I? Uh, what's my purpose in life? A lot of students, quite honestly, struggle with assurance of salvation. They say, am I really saved? I don't know if I'm saved or not. I can relate. When I was your age, I struggled big time. And I went through the sinner's prayer like a gazillion times trying to make sure am I saved. And I, I could speak to that more in depth at a, diff a different time. But we want to help you make sure that you know that you know that you know that you're going to heaven there are answers to that from the Word of God. You can know for sure you're saved. I'd be happy to talk to you even tonight if you have questions about that. Then I would say a, a third area would be struggles with addictions, uh, what the Bible might call life-dominating sins, things like 
pornography use, which is not only <clears throat> epidemic among guys, but increasingly among girls as well. Uh, probably addictions among video game usage, uh, maybe uh, things like, like uh, social media. These are the kind of things that come our way, and I just want you to know there are answers from God's Word to whatever problem you have, and that's why we're here. We have 14 people on our counseling staff to help you, not just me, lots of our gals as well. So some of the things we encounter. Yeah, that's, that's great. really good. And, and like you're saying, over and over, there's God's Word has the answer for all of those. Um, and if you're, uh, if you're here and you're a note taker, tonight would be a good night to take notes. And if you're on the Brazil team, you're supposed to be taking notes, so you better be. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> uh, so he's going to be throwing out lots of different answers and, uh, to questions and lots of different scripture. I'd encourage you to write these down, look them up later, especially if it's something that you're interested in or, or were, have been wondering about. Here's another question that came in. Uh, what would be a biblical definition of a toxic person, and are there distinctions between that and what the culture might define uh, toxic people to be, and how should we think or deal with toxic people? That's a common buzzword used today by people. I got these toxic people in my life. We've got to start with some basic definitions. If you turn to your Webster's Dictionary and look up the word toxic. Anybody tell me what that word means? It means poisonous. And we're talking about things like poisonous weeds or maybe a, a toxic waste dump where there's nuclear waste that's been deposited. Those things are bad, harmful to the health. Those are toxic substances. Well, when you draw a parallel over to relationships, we talk about toxic relationships. We're talking about poisonous relationships. So what are the relationships you might have that would be poisonous? Well, obviously, people that use or abuse you, infiltrate your thought system, your worldview, and try to get you to think somehow differently from what God's Word says. Those are toxic people, and there's lots of toxic people around, unfortunately. Um, toxic people would probably try to control you, play mind control games. They would try to abuse you. Uh, they, they might, a lot of buzzwords I'm hearing today, I, I counsel a lot of couples who are in trouble maritally. That's the number one thing I counsel. And they would say, you know, my spouse... <clears throat> is kind of toxic and uh, to be honest with you they're kind of controlling and a word that i hear is is stonewalling they they won't listen to me they just block me they, they won't let me interact with them another word i hear is, is gaslighting you ever heard that term gaslighting that means they try to make you think you're crazy you're actually pretty sane but they have their own agenda and they're trying to warp you and so they try to make you think that you're the crazy one that would probably be a toxic type of person now as i talk some of you are probably thinking of folks in your own life right now that would fit that description as being toxic uh, some passages to write down if you're taking notes i don't have time to turn and look at all these verses but galatians 5 verses 19 through 23 talks about toxic kinds of people, both in attitude, folks who are given toward anger, bitterness, wrath, um, shall we say clamor, that is fighting, folks who are given toward malice, that is ill will. They speak ill of others, they're gossipers, they're constantly talking about the other kids and they whisper in your ear about other kids and they're toxic people because they're poisonous in how they talk. The Bible also talks about moral toxicity. We're talking about people who are into all kinds of immorality, and that's listed in part in Galatians chapter 5, but also in Ephesians chapter 1, I should say chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. And it lists there what we should do with these kinds of toxic people, and it basically says in a phrase, do not become partners or partakers with them. You've got to remove these toxic thoughts from your heart and from your life. Now, just one more caveat. Don't think that everybody 
is so toxic that you have to build high walls and thick walls and stay isolated from everybody because then you'd have to leave this world. As believers, we're supposed to be salt and light. We're supposed to impact people. So there's some people who go over the top and they say, oh, I have to draw boundaries because this person's bad for me and that person's bad for me. And basically, after a while, they got nobody going on in their life. And they're all about themselves, and it really becomes self-centered meism. And the Bible says we're supposed to love people, even troubled people, even folks who are struggling with problems. Just because they have problems doesn't make them toxic. You're supposed to, if you're a believer, be salt and light. So don't go overboard in building boundaries. Be careful about that. Be Jesus Christ to them. That's a great word. Yeah, you're talking about toxic people. I'm the first thing that came to my mind was probably the the boys' bedrooms during Sub Zero. That's the that's toxic in my mind. The foot smell is absolutely incredible. But uh, you know, there are some people who are toxic, like you said, and then there's others who maybe they're not toxic, but maybe they're just not people that we would get along with that great. Maybe their personality is a little bit different than ours, or they have different likes or dislikes. You know, maybe it's somebody that's just a Nebraska fan or something where they, <laughs> they're they tough to get along with, um, but uh, they're not necessarily bad people. Um, is it okay to have close friends uh, if it means excluding other people? Because you talked about how, wondering how, where I fit in and, and how I can make friends. You say that's something that you counsel with a lot. Well, there's a lot of people that want to have those close friendships, but sometimes that seems to come at the expense of excluding other people. So uh, how do you know um, when you're being unloving and exclusive? Uh, and, and how do you know how much you should include people? Because even Jesus had sort of an inner circle. He had the 12 disciples and even top three amongst those 12. So how do you think about relationships in that regard? I'll have you turn to a few passages. If you have a Bible, maybe on your phone, turn to Romans chapter 12 a moment, if you would. Romans chapter 12. This this passage is paralleled by 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, if you want to write that into your notes. But I'm just going to restrict myself to Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. Romans 12 and verse 10. I want to just read for you. This, this is a wonderful passage that uh, helps us with a variety of interpersonal situations. And it gives us instruction for how we ought to treat other people. Romans 12 and verse 10. It simply says, love one another with brotherly affection. That's, that's a, an exhortation for all believers, we're supposed to be known by our love. Outdo one another in showing honor. You ought to show honor. The, the first Peter passage says, show honor to everybody. Now, if you're a believer in this room tonight, you're sitting with family, and everybody's an important part of the family. We don't exclude any part of the family. Um, churches sometimes get a rap for being cliquish. And that's always dangerous. Sometimes student ministries, youth groups get a rap for being cliquish. Admittedly, it's easier for us to hang with our friends and talk with them. But you saw a bunch of new students here tonight. Let's give them a round of applause, the ones that came. It's really crucial that you reach out to them, introduce yourself, and say, so good to have you here tonight. We're thrilled to have you on board. Maybe, maybe ask them to sit with you. I don't know how you work on your, your small groups or cell groups right after this, but be inclusive of everybody. That's not to say you don't have your BFFs, your, your best friends forever. I get that. We all have closer friends. There's no problem with that. But you do need to be inclusive of everybody because they're a part of the body of Christ. Um, the illustration, body of Christ, comes from 1 Corinthians 12, Jesus, of course, is, is really the head, and we're the parts of the body. And I don't know what part you are, or I think I know what part I am in, in one sense as a pastor. I'm a mouth, hopefully not a big mouth, but I'm supposed to speak the truth like these guys here. But you, you might be a hand, you might be an eye, you might be an ear. 
Uh, those are the more visible parts of the body, but some of us are feet or knees. Some of us might feel like we're armpits, <laughs> depending on how you look at yourself. The parts that are covered up underneath our clothing are, are less noticeable, obviously. But every part's important. Everybody's significant. Everybody in this room is important, and we ought to be inclusive of everybody, even though we probably do have some better friends, and that's okay. Great. All right. Yeah, that was really good. Kind of going along the same lines of talking about friends, uh, we've got a, a question that came in here specifically talking about grief. Here's what it said. I've got a friend who lost her mother to cancer when she was seven. In June, her aunt unexpectedly, unexpectedly died of a heart attack. And yesterday, her other aunt passed away due to COVID. How should I go about guiding her through this grief? I'm afraid that this might... Uh, this most recent loss might turn her away from God. Could you help us think through grief in general, but also um, personal grief and how to talk with others uh, through their own grief? Is that person likely here tonight, yeah. present with us? Whoever you are, let me say I love you, God loves you, I grieve with you. The Bible commands us to weep with those that weep. You have my sympathy. There aren't answers for everything. Sometimes we just have to sit down and say, I don't know why this happened, but I want you to know I care, and I'm here to listen. Listening is very important. Talking is sharing. Listening is caring. Christians need to be caring people. Last week, Pastor Pat and I were asked to go to a, a business here in the Des Moines metro. One of their coworkers suddenly died unexpectedly of a heart attack. Shocked everybody. They said, would you come and minister to us? So Pastor Pat and I did last Friday. We're going again this Friday. A mixture of primarily probably unsaved folks with a few believers. And I said to Pastor Pat, who shared the story of losing his wife, his first wife, suddenly at age 36 of a heart attack with seven children at home. You can imagine the pain Pastor Pat went through. He shared that, but I said, before you share, Pastor Pat, would you mind if I just gave everybody there a chance to talk about what they're feeling? And I explained to him, I said, I, I have found that when you listen well to other people, they're much more prone to listen to you. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And sometimes we Christians are just quick to jump right in. I got all the answers. You just shut up. I'm going to tell you the truth. And they're not going to listen to you until they really know how much you care. So I would say to you, sit down with your friend and weep with her. Uh, try to listen well. Ask her questions. How do you feel? How does, what are you going through? You, you may know the five stages of grief that are commonly talked about, like denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then finally, acceptance. I mentioned that to the folks last Friday, and they just started opening up. I, I, I told the people there, I said, I've been through grief too. I, my grandfather committed suicide on our family farm in northwest Iowa. Instantly, a woman started crying. I was to find out in just a few moments, her grandfather committed suicide too. That's very hard to go through. Once we open it up, I mean, the tears just flowed. And, and just for the record, my office, which is right over there, is a river of tears. It's unusual for folks not to cry in my office. And that's often inclusive of men folk as well. Tears are, are very, very prevalent. We, we need to let people cry. It's okay when your heart comes out of your eyes. It's the way the Lord's made us. Um... We're supposed to share or bear one of those burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's Galatians 6, verse 2. Um, we don't have answers to everything, but I, I do want to give you one answer. You, you say, well, where, where was God when my friend or relative died? I've written a couple of books in the last couple of years. The first one to try to help my counselees it's called 30 Days of Gospel Living. And, and I address in here, I've got a chapter on 
people who struggle with uh, sickness and hurt and, and pain. And uh, I'm just going to read you a quote from this book about where is God when I'm suffering? Doesn't he care? I quote, in his book, 90 Days of Gospel Goodness or of God's Goodness, Randy Elkhorn gives us great perspective. Now listen carefully. However great our suffering, his was far greater. If you feel angry at God, what price would you have him pay for his failure to do more for people facing suffering and evil? Would you inflict capital punishment on him? You're too late. No matter how bitter we feel toward God, could any of us come up with a punishment worse than what God chose to inflict upon himself? Listen to me. God loved us so much, he died for us to pay for our sin. He cares. When Jesus lost his friend Lazarus, knowing he was going to resurrect him momentarily, he still wept. God cares passionately for you. He cared so much he sent his son to the cross to die for you. And by the way, that's the way you're saved if you've never been saved. You have to believe for yourself he died for your sins and rose again. And if you really believe that in your heart, you'll become one of God's children too. And he'll make you compassionate toward those who are hurting. Just like Jesus. Thank you, Pastor Kurt. That was really great. Um, we're going to transition a little bit. We've been talking about relationships uh, in sort of one sphere w with parents and with uh, friends and that sort of thing. The, a lot of the rest of our questions have to do with relationships between guys and girls, you know, from people on this side of the room with people on this side of the room. <laughs> And uh, our students have a lot of questions about things like dating and, and all that. So we want to start kind of at the beginning. We had one question come in uh, that kind of made me chuckle, but it's, uh, it's a fair question. It's a good one. And the question is, I, uh, why do I like girls so much? <laughs> it all starts with suddenly when I get into middle school maybe, just started liking girls. They used to be gross, and now they're not anymore. What's going on? <laughs> Shed some light on this for us, Pastor Kurt. Help us out. Okay, guys, all who would agree, why do I like girls so much? Raise your hand. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on. Be honest. Like You're in church. <laughs> Got a bunch of liars. <laughs> <laughs> why do I like girls so much? Because that's the way God made me. <laughs> and every guy here, he, he made you that way, because that question came from a guy, okay? <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> but the gals, they start liking guys, too, and it usually happens around puberty, you know, that, that change time, you know, 11, 12, 13, in that neighborhood, it starts to happen. Um, you know, if you go all the way back to our first parents, Adam and Eve, Adam initially was created and he was alone, and God let him name all the animals, and he was bummed because none of them looked good to him. I'm glad for that. <laughs> and then God put him to sleep and performed a surgery, pulled out a rib, and made Eve, a woman. And when Adam woke up, his eyes nearly bugged out of his head like, whoa, 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 like, woman which sounds like man because it is like man. The Hebrew word for man is ish, and the Hebrew word for woman is isha. They're related words. It's like, ooh, somebody like me, only feminine and soft and nice and woo. He got excited in a hurry. It's the way God makes us. Me, won't you? Yeah. And they got married right there on the spot. No courtship, just bam. There they went. <laughs> it's the way God made us. Now, <laughs> let, me, uh, let me just say this, because we're going to be talking about sex here a lot in these next few questions. Uh, sex is God's idea. Sex is good. Sex is not dirty. Sex is not sinful, okay? Sex is good in marriage, where God meant it. Now, a lot of gals who maybe been abused or don't like themselves, they think sex is gross, a lot of guys 
think sex is God. It's like everything. It's the end game. Sex is everything. The biblical perspective is God says sex is a gift. It's not gross. It's not God. It's not everything. It's a gift. What's it a gift meant for? It's a gift meant for married people. If you'd light a match out west, I spent 27 years in the Seattle area as a pastor, beautiful mountainous region, a lot of forest fires. You, you, let a, you light a match in a forest area, you can burn down a lot of acres. You don't want fire out of control. But at home in my house, I like a fire in my furnace when it's cold because it's controlled and it brings a lot of benefit, quite obviously. So sex is meant for the right, appropriate place. Um, let's go on to the next question because I think yeah. we're going to keep rolling here. Yeah, the kind of along those lines, so you start liking girls. The no, another question that came in is, when is it appropriate to start dating? When is it appropriate? What do you think? Maybe an age. They're probably looking at an age. Uh, <laughs> 35, 36. <laughs> And the parents say, no, that's too early, Kurt. That's too early. <laughs> okay, let me get serious. And I, I might shock you with my answer. When's the appropriate time to start dating? All depends on your definition of dating. But if you're interested, ultimately, with the goal of the end game of getting married, you should start dating when you could soon be married. I was not expecting applause on that one. Wow. Okay, we'll be unwrapping this a little bit more. My, my wife got a lot of wisdom. Uh, most of us probably dated some when we were in our teen years, but I, I think what my wife says is true. When you date, when you're a teen, two things can happen. You either get married or you get hurt. Think about it. How many teens do you know that get married? Very, very few. Which tells me there's a lot of hurt going on. Because you get all wrapped up in that person, and you're all into each other. And it's like, whoa. And then they break up with you. Ah! And I'm not, I'm not downplaying that pain. I'm simply saying, listen to me carefully. God's never in a hurry, but Satan always is. You can write that into your notes. God's never in a hurry, but Satan always is. And God gives the best to those who leave the choice to him. My recommendation, quite frankly, is to do group socializing. That doesn't mean you don't like certain people a little bit more than others, and you kind of hang with them some, but you do it in a more of a group context rather than singling each other out and getting into a lonely, isolated place where lots of stuff can happen. You do things in groups when you're a student, maybe in high school, and you show some interest, but you do it in a group kind of context. I think socializing in a group is, is safer in all honesty. Um, we'll go into the next question, which goes even deeper. Yeah, so start with liking somebody, and then you've moved to dating. And now the next sort of follow-up question that uh, we talked about a little bit last week, depending on what group you were in, but uh, the follow-up question to that might be, well, when you're dating somebody, how far is too far uh, in terms of sexual contact or, uh, you know, kissing Holding hands, are those okay? What about uh, going even further than that? How far is too far when you're dating somebody? And then uh, what, does that ever change? You know, if you get engaged, does that open up something else? And, you know, uh, does that ever change depending on how old you are or anything like that? <laughs> okay, here we go. Buckle your seatbelts. <laughs> Um, is that an evil it's, laugh? It's, or a... I'm just trying to build up courage. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or 
Lord help her. <laughs> um, it's the wrong question. The person who asked that question is really saying, I want to get as close to the line as I can. And once in a while, I might sneak across when no one's looking. Instead of, what can I do to most glorify God? The average Christian doesn't live with the right world view. They want to get as close to the world in the line of sin as they can, hoping that maybe they can follow the rules and only step across occasionally. One of my favorite preachers is John Piper, who says, God is most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in him. And I'm afraid a lot of people don't live their Christian life that way. They live by a bunch of rules. If I can do this and do this and not do this and not do this, then I'm going to be okay. And God wants your heart. He wants a relationship. And he's not looking for you to try to find an out. He's looking for you to love him with all your heart. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all to the glory of God. And that includes relationships. By definition, sexuality includes doing some stuff to the other sex that's reserved for marriage. We're, we're into biblical purity. You say, what's the definition of purity? It's living by God's original design. That's the biblical definition for purity. Living by God's original de design. I'm going to do you some reading. This is a book I highly recommend by Josh McDowell. It's entitled The Bare Facts, B-A-R-E. <laughs> the subtitle, don't let it scare you, parents, if you're watching online. 39 questions your parents hope you will never ask about sex. <laughs> That's a little misleading. These are the questions you want your students to ask about sex, but probably in your hearing. Great book. Josh McDowell leaves no stone unturned in here. Everything you want to hear and know is in here, but it's, it's for you and your parents to go through, not for me to go in depth tonight. But I want to read you some excerpts from this particular book that I've really found helpful. Um, I, I'm going to turn to some of these pages and just do a little bit of reading for you. <clears throat> Story time with Pastor Kurt. Yeah, story time with Pastor Kurt. Sitting by the roaring fire, <laughs> contained in a fireplace. A nice visual image there, Andrew. Uh, how can I say no is the chapter, or the question 34. He, he, he gives some, some uh, ideas here. He says you have to set clear boundaries before you need them. Now I'm going to fast forward maybe even into an engagement period. But your body wasn't designed to be able to just stop feeling things sexually. It was designed to continue to move towards sex in the context of committed marriage relationship. If you get into a situation where things get physical and your mind is allowed to dwell on sexual images, it'll be hard to pull up the reins. Set clear boundaries about what you will do physically and what situations you will allow yourself in ahead of time before the opportunity arises. For example, in order to avoid the temptation to look at pornography, you might establish a boundary that you will only look at the computer in a public room where others are around, or maybe have a filter on your computer so it reports if you're looking at something you shouldn't. We've got to get serious. Pornography is a major problem which infects and affects a lot of marriages. Let me tell you, I counsel it with regularity. Here's another one that kind of goes along with what I said before. This is from Josh. Delay romance. Now listen to me. Studies have shown a profound link between early dating and early sex. Dating brings a couple together physically and emotionally. Closeness prompts physical contact, which releases powerful bonding hormones and revs up the powerful sexual engines for both parties. Research proves that the younger young people begin to date, the more likely they are going to become sexually active. For example, of those young people who begin dating at age 12, 91% will have sex before graduating from high school. Of those who delay dating until 15, 40% lose their virginity in high school. Of those who, individuals who wait until 16 to begin dating, only 20% have sex before graduation. Waiting for romance will help you wait for sex. You were designed for sex. Once you get into a relationship, 
you can start to find yourself really struggling. That's why you need to wait for a romance until you're ready to get married. If you're ready to get married, I don't recommend long romances, long engagements. Just get married. And then God, he applauds when you have sex and marriage. This is my idea. Yay! It's God's idea. It's a wonderful, beautiful thing. In marriage, keep the fire in the furnace, not in the forest. Okay. Um, a little bit more information here uh, that from our, our friend, he, he says here, uh, about how far is too far. That's the next question, number 35. He talks about the no hinting principle, Ephesians 5.3. You can write under your notes. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Not even, even a hint so, I'm not going to get into specifics here, but it's hard to shut down the engines when you start doing certain things with each other. So, wait until marriage. So, how do you treat the person that's not your mate? 1 Timothy 5, 1 answers the question, you treat her, him, like a sister or a brother. And most of you are not tempted to mess around with your sister or your brother, right? I hope the answer to that is right. Okay, you treat them because they're your sister or brother in Christ. And you treat them as such. That's the biblical uh, worldview on that particular issue. Um, okay, enough for that one. Yeah, that's really good. Really helpful. Here's another one, uh, another question that came in, uh, it's kind of along those lines, I guess, maybe a little bit more about modesty. Here's what it says. Is it sinful for a girl to wear a crop top? I know guys are more visual generally than girls, but does that mean that modesty is solely the responsibility of women, or is there responsibility in this area for both guys and girls? Do boys maybe need to think about modesty as well? They do. Uh, it's for both. Our, our culture has the idea, you know, the girl needs to be responsible for how she dresses and what goes on behind closed doors. The guy's kind of off the hook. That's baloney. You're a Christian guy. You're as responsible as she is. We, we need to be sensitive to the other sex and most of all to the Lord himself. So is it sinful for a girl to wear a crop top? Okay. Um, basically, you know, physiology here guys are stimulated by sight so gals you may not realize that you want to look really nice want to kind of look you know alluring that could be very difficult for guys if i'm brutally honest with you sometimes i look around church and i say ooh, uh, not healthy for guys to see what she's wearing by the same token guys need to be mindful of what they're wearing too uh, Protect the sexual stimulus zones. What are we talking about? From here to the upper legs, okay? That's the sexual stimulus zone. Keep that responsible and modest, guys and gals. It's no more fair, guys, for you to be flexing stuff than it is for her to be showing stuff that's turning you on. You got to be sensitive. You got to be careful here. Um, Passage of Scripture. Let's turn to Romans 14. Romans 14. And let me just read a few verses. Romans 14, verses 13 and 14 and 19. This talks about things where we can stumble each other, cause problems. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but here it is, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. Um... Verse 12, let's go back to that verse. So then each of us must give an account of himself to God. We, we will stand before God someday for how we do in this area. Down to verse 19. So then let us pursue what makes for peace, and watch this, and for mutual upbuilding. I want to protect my brother's eyes, my sister's eyes and thoughts, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dress modestly. Uh, I think you can talk to your parents about this. Talk to your peers, your youth staff, your youth leaders here. You can talk about that. I'm not going to legislate, but you do have to be exceedingly careful uh, what, that, what that looks like and 
be responsible toward the other sex and not being a temptation to them. That's really good, especially as we're entering into warmer weather and summer and all of that. There's, yeah. you know, obviously a lot more of uh, immodesty that goes around during these warmer months. And so that's helpful. Um, we're going to transition a little bit. We're still kind of in this area of uh, sexuality, but something that I want to make sure we address is um, there's just been a huge increase over the last several years in uh, questions about sexuality related to the LGBTQ movement. And um, that's just becoming more and more prevalent in our culture. And so a, a question to start us off here, somebody asked, if a person wants to be referred to as the opposite sex, or maybe get you know a, a new name, they, they're changing their gender, they're transitioning, whatever, they wanna be called by a new name or, or referred to by a new pronoun or whatever, should we use their given name that they were given at birth, or should we say, you know, even though I used to know you as Sally, I'll start calling you Harry or whatever, you know. Uh, do we, is it, is it a sin? Is it us supporting their, uh, their sin if we're going along with them in that, or is, is, would that just be a respectful thing to say, sure, I'll call you whatever you want me to call you? Let, let me start out with a note of sympathy for those who are struggling with sexual identity, including those who are into the trans movement. Usually those who are struggling have been through some sort of trauma. Maybe they've been abused or hurt. Maybe their parents have divorced. Maybe something's happened to them that's just tipped them over. We need to find out what, what's going on in your life because often they're very confused, they're very angry, and that includes anger toward God. And we need to try to listen and, and try to understand what's happening. That being said, you, you need to hear the truth. There is no such thing as transgender. I'm, I'm talking Bible now. From, from a biological point of view, we're talking biology 101 or physiology 101, you, you are either in your chromosomes XX or XY. You say, you lost me, Kurt. An XX chromosome person is a female. An XY chromosome person is a male. And when a couple gets married and they have sex, the sperm joins with the egg. We call that a zygote. And the male passes one of his chromosomes, either the X or the Y chromosome, onto his wife's egg. And when it's fertilized, whether he sends the X or the Y determines the sex of the child that's born. So it comes from the male rather than the female. If he sends the Y chromosome over, then that baby's going to be a boy. If he sends the X chromosome over, it's going to be a girl. Girls are XX, guys are XY. Now this is basic physiology. You can understand. Now this is Jesus from Matthew 5 verse 4. From the beginning, God made them male and female. That's Jesus. It's the way God made you. The man-made notion that you are something other than what you are is the result of broken thinking. And when supported by culture, it's an attack on God and the order that God created. Transgenderism is a kind of personal suicide. It is the end of your existence in the way God designed you. Listen to me carefully. You are 19 times more likely to kill yourself if you are transgender because you have completely cut yourself off from reality and from normal relationships. When you become transgender, it's the end of your personal identity. It's the end of your ability to have a real marriage, to have children biologically. It's a kind of extremism. You're basically saying, I am not who I am. And it makes you go crazy. Because God made you. He loves you. He designed you. He made you male. He made you female. He's got a plan for you. If you follow his plan, he will bless you. If you curse him and go off on your own, you will suffer the repercussions. So I'm begging for your soul, quite frankly, that you listen to biblical truth here. Uh, back to the question. Again, I think we need to be sympathetic. Uh, that person who says, I want to be called 
Harry instead of Sally, uh, I, I would simply say to them, I'm going to call you friend. I'm not going to enable you by calling you Harry. <laughs> no, I'm going to call you friend. You may not even need to say that. You just say friend. You're not trying to be incendiary, mean toward them. But I want, I want to listen to you. I want to love you biblically. I want you to, to tell me what's going on in your heart and your soul. And uh, it's really crucially important for us to understand that when we tell them truth, we are loving them in a godly biblical way. We don't love them by telling them what they want to hear because they've been perverted by sin or by the culture. You say, where do you get that from the Bible, Kurt? Okay, look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6. And I'm going to look at verse 9. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. And verse 10. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, these are the folks not going to heaven, if this is their lifestyle determination, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, that's idolatry through sex, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. That one word in my ESV version is actually rendered in two different words in the Greek. It talks about catamites. That's a Greek word that means the guy that plays the feminine role in a homosexual relationship. He's the passive one. And then there's an aggressive one, the active one. So it's actually talking about two categories, both the passive and the aggressive one in the relationship. That's both included in this word for homosexuality here. So the Bible actually speaks about people who think of themselves as being trans or in a homosexual relationship saying, I'm something other than I am, and I'm going to be the receiver rather than the giver of the sexual act. It, it actually talks about them specifically. I go on. Uh, he says, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That means that anybody, no matter what they've done, can be saved by the blood of Christ. If they'll believe, if they'll repent, they can be saved and transformed by the gospel, as was the case in the church at Corinth and as the case in the church at Sayreville. Yeah, that's really good. And that, that basically includes all of us. I mean, we're not coming down on s yeah. simply homosexuals or others. They're thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, anybody mm -hmm. who's ever lied. That pretty much includes all of us. Mm -hmm. And so that's what that passage is talking about. That's really good. So kind of going along that, we had another question that came in that said, how do I share the gospel with a transgender person? And we'll end with this one. This will be our last one. Remember what I said early on. You've got to learn to listen to people, even if they're messed up. Listen to them and love on them and care about them. People know if you care. They really do. And Christians ought to care. So listen to them. But how do you, how do you witness to a tran transgender person? <laughs> you witness to them the same way you witness to anybody else. You tell them they're a sinner who needs to repent that Jesus died to pay for their sin and rose again, that they'll turn from their sin and believe the gospel that Christ gave his life as a sacrifice for them and invite him into their lives by faith, they too will be saved and God will give them the grace to get their lives back into order with what God commands in his word. That's awesome. Kurt, we're really thankful that you came tonight. We're really thankful to be able to talk to you about some of these questions. We almost got through all of them, but uh, you know, we, we do want to reserve a little bit of time for our small sure. groups tonight. So uh, we're thankful for you. You guys give Pastor Kurt a hand. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We told you he's got lots of wisdom. Lots of <laughs> wisdom. He can answer any question. Well, God's word can. <laughs> yeah. And guys, just so you know, Pastor Kurt works here. And that means that while it's great to have uh, him in on, on these 
night. Uh, you know, this is our first time ever doing this. It's really cool having you here. Uh, but if you have questions about this kind of stuff, uh, you can talk to Kurt anytime, I think, right? Well, yeah. probably not. At, don't text him at one I, in the morning. I, I just or want to promise you if you come into my office, I'm going to be gentle, kind. I'm not going to be condemning. I don't have a shotgun in my closet. There's no hammer or sledgehammer in there, you know. I don't have a baseball bat to hit you. I'm, I'm going to love on you, help you. I'm going to show you the truth of God's word. I really care about you. I say that genuinely. So do these guys. So do all your youth staff. So do all the counselors, 14 strong at our church. We care about you. We love you. God's word has the answers and is found in Jesus Christ. Thank you. That's great. Uh, Kurt, would you mind closing our time in prayer? And then we'll split up into our small groups. Lord, I, I love these kids enough to tell them the truth, these students. Thank you for their good listening tonight. I'm really encouraged by that. I pray you to help them to have a biblical worldview, to think according to Scripture, and to live it out, because that's the happiest way to live, is in accord with what you've told us. Lord, I pray that you'd save every student here and help us to align up with what you've given us in your word and, and protect us from the enemy. Oh, God, I see so much sorrow in my office because people haven't lived according to what you've instructed. And I pray preserve them, protect them. Lord, I'd rather build a fence at the top of the cliff preventatively than park an ambulance below where they've crashed and burned. I just pray you'd protect these precious ones and help them to have good discussion now and bless all of this youth ministry here for Jesus' sake, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. You guys can